I want to be able to hear God and not because I'm preoccupied. Challenge me! You gotta be willing to do what God tells you. Good endings. Job 8 7 says this even though you're not much right now, you'll end up better than ever. Even though your money may not be much right now, even though your health may not be much right now, even though your relationship or your job situation may not be much right now, you'll end up better than ever. It says, although your beginning was small, today you may feel like you're small. Today you may feel like you're insignificant. Today you may feel like nothing is happening in your life. Today you may be at a point where you're saying everyone else seems to be blessed and everyone else seems to prosper. Everyone else is getting married. Everyone is having kids. Everyone else's dreams and ambitions are coming to pass. And I just feel so small. The Bible says your latter days will be very great. And last of all, it says your beginnings will seem humble. So prosperous will your future be. If you're like me, I love good endings. I love good endings to songs. One of my favorite writers is a guy named Jim Croce, who writes about bad, bad Leroy Brown. Or don't mess around with Jim. Don't tug on Superman's cape. Don't spit into the wind. How many remember that song? It always ends good. I love the ending to a good book. For 12 years when I went through high school and from Kenny Garden on, I only read one book cover to cover. I know I'm ashamed of it. I've only read one book when I was in the 12th grade. Older, I've read a lot of books. But when I was going through school, I only read one book from cover to cover. That one book that I read was called Shane. Shane. How many of you like Shane, the movie? Shane ends good. He said, Shane. Shane. Come back, Shane. Mama loves you, Shane. Papa, take care of you, Shane. I just love good endings. Love a good endings to stories that are told, where there's tragedy and hardship and adversity. And someone is at the end of breaking in their situation, but that tragedy turns to a triumph, and the story is not, the story does not end in hopelessness. I remember in 1994, I got fired from ministry. No one supported me. I did not have a church. I did not have a paycheck. I didn't have resources. I wanted nothing to do at that particular time about re-entering the church. But I want you to know 22 years later, God has raised up an amazing church that you are part of one way or another. I just love great endings to stories. I recently heard a story of a lady by the name of Marguerite uh, Bar, Bar and Kittis, and she is from uh, Burundi, and there were two major tribes fighting with one another, the Hutus and the Tutsis, and they fled, and she fled to the archbishop's home with her friends and their kids and her kids. There were 72 of them in total. All of a sudden, the Tutsis began to rebel and, and, and canvass the homes, and she was captured, and she was stripped naked and put in a chair. And they killed all her friends and all the kids, 72 of them in total, and beheaded her best friend and threw the head in her lap. I want you to know that 
20 years have now passed and she's raised up the house of peace. Over 3,000 homes, school, farm, hospital, even a bank, and she has saved 20,000 orphanages. There is a story that ended well. And I don't care where you are in life today. I'm sorry what happened to you through the divorce and through the loss of a loved one or through the bankruptcy or through the betrayal, but you need to know it's not over until God says it's over. You need to know this beyond a slogan and beyond something that you put on a wall or beyond something that feels good to say. You need to know the best is yet to come. Here's what God says in his word. It's found in Joel, the second chapter. He begins to talk about restoration. And good endings have these R's in it. Wherever there's a good ending, there is always restoration. Wherever there's a good ending, there is always a good report that will come out of it, a good story. Wherever there's a good ending, there is a rejoicing. You're not always going to be sorrowful. You're not always going to be depressed. You're not always going to be saddened. Your laughter is going to return. Your dance is going to be returned. Your smile is going to be returned. There will be a rejoicing. And good endings happen because sometimes we have to repent. We have to change. You want to guarantee a good ending to your life, to your marriage, to whatever you put your hands to? You're going to have to live with that thing that maybe I have to repent of something. But there will be a level of restoration. Here's what Joel says. I just want to read you what Joel says. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts. Notice he says four kinds of locusts that devour. Now, first of all, I want you to recognize he says, I will restore to you the years. He didn't just say, I'll restore to you the days, I'll restore to you the months, I'll restore to you the weeks. I will restore to you the years of damage, the years of heartache, the years of rejection, the years of abandonment. How long you've been doing something or what has happened to you is not an intimidation to God. God can restore anything. God can restore everything. Nothing in God ends bad. Say that with me. Nothing in God ends bad. Now say it with conviction. Nothing in God ends bad. He says, I will restore to you the years. Now here's the picture that you need to recognize. These are four devourers or four insects that come and steal a harvest of a vineyard or a fruit tree or whatever you might want to insert right there. So here is, just envision, you, you've planted something, you've watered something, you've cared for something, and you are anticipating the fruit on that vineyard. So one day you walk out and you see, oh man, in the next day, 24 hours, man, I'm going to have the best fruit I've ever had before. That night, all of a sudden, a swarm of locusts come, and it devours the fruit that's on your tree. You're discouraged, but you say it's okay. Because you know what? I can bud again. I will do it. The next night you come and another swarm of locusts have come and they devoured the leaves and the limb. You think, okay, well, listen, I, I still have the trunk and it will just sprout again. It will regrow. It's going to take a lot longer, but you know. And then the third night you go out and another locust come and it eats the trunk. You're saying, oh my God, is it ended? Is it hopeless? Am I ever going to have a harvest? Am I ever going to have breakthroughs, miracles? Am I ever going to have blessings in my life? Is my situation ever going to turn around? Because the moment I begin to do something, all of a sudden devourers come into my life. The fourth locust is the one that comes and gets the roots under the ground. Now you're left with nothing. And that's the picture God wants you to have today. It doesn't matter what the locusts have come and done in your life, the devourers have come to do, the destroyers in your life. God can restore everything.
Hey, I want to talk to a little bit of the real audience, all you faithful followers and watchers. If you got a tremendous story of how this program has touched your life, changed your life, or benefited your life, we'd love to highlight it some way by sharing your story, maybe with someone that hasn't heard the change that's taken place through this program. Your story will inspire others' stories that will cause transformation to take place. Help me to build the kingdom of God. Share your story with us. We'd love to hear from you. I love good endings to movies. I love how the movie ends in The Wizard of Oz. Annie M., there's no place like home. There is no place like home. There is no place like home. I love how Greece ends with Danny, part of the T-Birds, and the, and, and, and the Pink Ladies with Sandy, and they're singing as they're in the T-Bird going off to heaven. Summer nights had me a blast. Summer loving happened so fast. I just love good Andy. I love Rocky. The Andy, yo, <laughs> You hate, you hate me, I did it, I did it, I did it. I just love good endings. One of my favorite movies of all time, I haven't seen the remake, is Ben-Hur. If I watch Ben-Hur next to you, I will weep like a baby. You will see me go through emotions that you've probably never seen me before. Because it's a story of a wealthy man, a wealthy family who loses everything, and someone does something harmful to them, and all of a sudden they're taken into slavery, and the family is dispersed abroad. Mama and sister eventually are thrown into a prison, and in that prison they uh, get leprosy, and so Miriam and Tears are now living in a leopard colony. Uh, Judah Ben-Hur has to go into slavery. He's bound in chains. He now has a hatred in his heart. He has an anger in his heart toward a man that has done him wrong in his life. He eventually meets up with his mom and meets up with his sister, and there's a state of hopelessness. They're going to die. Tears is probably going to die in a matter of moments and minutes. But I, on down the Via Della Rosa comes a Messiah called Jesus Christ. And with the little thread of hope that Judah Ben-Hur has, he ushers his family into the presence of Jesus and the shadow of Jesus heals Miriam and tears. And it softens the heart of this angry man and changes his life. It's a good ending. And that's what I pray happens to you. What if I told you today whatever you were going through was going to end good? What if I told you that? Whatever is harassing you today, whatever is intimidating you today, whatever is scaring you today, if you knew what you were going through was going to end good, what would you do? How do I know that to be true? Because this book is full of stories that ended good. Which one do you want to choose? A matter of fact, I have read the end of the book. And so tell, let me tell you what the end of the book says. It's good. And it's better than Campbell's soup. Mmm, mmm, good. And it's better. How many of you know what I'm talking about? than Maxwell Coffee. It's good to the last drop because the Bible says at the very end, the devil is thrown into the lake of fire. There is a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords, and we are welcomed into his presence. We throw our crowns at his feet. There'll be no more sorrow, the Bible says. There'll be no more sickness, the Bible says. There'll be no more death, the Bible says. And, and John the Revelator comes. He's so excited about what he sees the future to be. He says, Lord, come quickly. I can't wait to the end because it ends good. That's the future. I want, you, I want to read you a story. It's found in the book of Ruth. It's found in the book of Ruth. 
Now, there are many examples of good endings, but I'll start off with just simply this story in the book of Ruth. Now, the beginning is fill, filled with tragedy. The, the, the beginning of the book is filled with heartache. In fact, the beginning of the book is filled with death. It's filled with death. The story is told here in Ruth, the first chapter, that first of all, Naomi's husband dies. And, 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 and Naomi is left with two boys, and they are raised, and they marry two women from a, a Moabitess. And then both Naomi's sons die. And the Bible says that even Ruth, it says here, now they took wives of the women of Moab, verse 4, and the name of one was Opah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelt about 10 years, and then both Mahalan, the son, and Chalon also died. So the women were survived, her two sons and her husbands. Hopelessness all around us. So we get introduced not only to Nomi, the circumstance, but we get introduced to Ruth. Ruth has nothing. Back in those days, it's not like our days. Women absolutely depend upon the men of their lives. Women, to some degree, do not have the liberties that men have. They don't necessarily have jobs. They don't necessarily have incomes. They don't necessarily have careers. And then to have a, wo a, a woman who does not have a child where there could be acts of mercy and benefits given to her. I just want you to get this picture of Ruth. There's a sense of hopelessness in her life. She has no money. She has no job. She has no home. She has no family to come and support her. And so she travels with her mother-in-law back to Jerusalem. And in this place of devastation, we'll just go. It's only four chapters, and if you want to read it this week, to pick up the in-between. In verse number 13 of chapter 4, it says, so Boaz took Ruth. Now, you're introduced to this character named Boaz. Boaz is the wealthiest man in the city. He got, he, he, he's got money. He, he, he has cash. He has cars. He has real estate. He gets paid. Say that with me. He gets paid. Okay. And so it just so happens that this is going, he's never been married and he has no kids. Okay. Thought I'd throw that in, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so moving right along. So Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception. Listen, she, so it tells me that she tried the first time to give birth with her husband. But it didn't happen. Have you ever been in a place in your life when you are trying as hard as you can to give birth to something? The vision, the dream, the goal, but I can't give birth. It's sterile. It gets aborted. But here she goes, and she gives birth in her conception, and she has a son. And the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel. And he will. His name is Obed because he will eventually become the great-great-grandfather of Jesus himself. And may he be to you a restorer of life. This is what Christ is to us. He is the restorer of our life and the nourishment of our old age. That's how good God is to us. He restores our lives and he nourishes us in our loss and in our pain and in the deepest wound and secrets of our hearts. Hey guys, in our endeavor to become much more personal and be much more relational and to get to know you a little bit better, if you have a question that you'd like to ask me, I'm not gonna claim to be a Bible scholar or a great theologian, or maybe even to know uh, all the answers, but I'll try to my best of my ability uh, to respond to you with any question that you might have that we might be able to help you to get close to Christ, know Him, or further your faith in Him. Love to hear from you.
Now, the children of Israel are before the Red Sea. Pharaoh's armies are behind them. Here's what God says in verse number 15. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod. Now, we know the end of the story, don't we know? Yes, the Red Sea is divided, and Pharaoh and his mighty army are drowned in the Red Sea. That's a good ending. God is going to do his part. He is going to intervene. He's going to split the waters. He's going to let them walk on dry ground, and he's going to let them fall back and destroy them. But what does Moses have to do? Moses has to stretch forth his rod. I don't know what your rod represents, but God's going to look at you and say, if you want a good ending, then you better stretch forth your rod. You do something that I'm asking you to do, and then I will move. How many of you heard this statement so many times? You do this first, and then this will happen. But if you don't do the first, uh, I've had money owed to me. I have a refund owed to me. I go and I go and claim it. It's mine. It's mine. But they say, could you just do some paperwork first? What if I tell, I don't want to do no paperwork? What if I don't want to do paperwork? Most, I ain't getting my money. I got to do the first before there's a response. And sometimes in the kingdom of God, there's a first before there is a response. I don't know I, how many of you love In-N-Out burgers. Anybody love In-N-Out burgers in here? Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Now, let me ask you something. Do you know that there is a secret menu at In-N-Out? It's not on the board. See, you've been only, only ordering off the board. Hamburger, cheeseburger, double-double. French fries, soda shake. Do you know there are more than 80 things you can order in the secret menu, if you know the secret menu? They don't advertise it. They don't tell you. Did you know that you can have a four by four? How many of you ever had a four by four? Raise your hand. I'm looking at you. You did have, you've had a few four by fours, haven't you? Maybe an eight by eight looking at you, but anyway. See, you know that. It's, how many of you ever gone to the menu and seen a four by four? It's not there. How many of you say, I want my hamburger cooked animal style? Doesn't say animal. Doesn't say animal on the board, does it? You got to know that. It's secret. You have to ask for it. You have to ask for it. How many of you know you could have chili cheese fries there? Yeah. How many of you know you could have a grilled cheese sandwich there? How many of you know you can ask for a Neapolitan? See, you're only having the vanilla shake. Well, what kind of shake you want? They only have vanilla and chocolate. Syrup. No, they have a Neapolitan. Why don't you know these things? So I, that's why I have an In-N-Out truck outside waiting for you after service and all, all proceeds. No, I don't. Yes, I do. All proceeds come to me, so go buy your in and out. No, there's no in and out out there. You got to do something. To have a true God intervention in your life and a good ending, you got to do something. Something is required of you. You know, one of the reasons why that God rejected Saul in 1 Samuel 22 tells us, because Saul was a very stubborn man. We don't put a high price on stubbornness. We put a high price on adulterer, fornicator, liar, cheater. But God called stubbornness rebellion. And the man was very, very stubborn. Stubbornness just simply means an unwillingness to change. If you want a good ending, you're going to have to get rid of the stubbornness of your life and the unwillingness to change and do it my way. You've got to do it God's way. I don't care if you're 55 years old, 75 years old, 24 years old. You've got to stop being stubborn in your life. There were two ships headed for each other in 1986 in the Black Sea off of the Russian coast. They collided and hundred peop hundreds of people died in the frigid water. The cause of the accident was not weather, radar, technology, or defective equipment. It was just simply two stubborn captains that wouldn't change their course. I'm asking God to look at the stubbornness of my life, where I'm just plain stubborn. Because I want there to be good endings in my life. And if I've got to repent, let me repent. If I've got to change, let me change. But I don't want to be rejected because of my stubbornness.
Hey guys, here I am. Behind me is a play going on called The Walking Dead, just like the television or the hit show. And it doesn't really matter if you don't know what it's about. But let me just tell you a little bit about the fact that outside of Christ, we are dead into sin. See, we can't help but sin. Whatever that looks like, drinking too much, jealousies, envy, gossiping, sexual immorality, perversion, Whatever it is, lying and cheating, we can't help but do that because our DNA, we were born into sin. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.1, you have he quickened or made alive who were dead in sin. We were born into sin. That's why Jesus came to this earth to rescue us from our sin nature. See, there's a consequence to everything. And the consequence to our sin is damnation, separation, alienation, and really just separation from God. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is a death. The amazing thing is, is that we don't have to die spiritually. We don't have to be separated from God in this lifetime or in the next lifetime. We could come to faith today in Jesus Christ by saying, I need a Savior for my sin. You see, in The Walking Dead, there's all these zombies, they call them walkers. Kind of their blood is all toxified, like sin, and they're trying to generate that poison into other people with a bite or consuming them. What protects us from the sin of the world? I don't know about you, I haven't been saved all my life, and, and sin is very, very real. The Bible is very real about it. It's, the Bible says it's very attractive, it's very appealing, and it's very pleasing. So what is our antidote that we don't succumb to that sin which, which will eventually separate us from God is Jesus Christ. He could purify our blood so that the zombies and the walkers don't kill us spiritually. We like Walking Dead have a Rick, which is Jesus Christ, he is our Savior, and we could be part of the nucleus of the family called the family of God and have eternal life today. Maybe today you feel like you've already been bit. I mean, a life has been sucked out of you because of experiences, associations, things you've done that have brought shame, guilt, or condemnation. Well, today you could partake of Jesus Christ, who is the remedy and the antidote for the sin, the bite of sin in your life. And you could be transformed into the kingdom of light and made a new creature in Christ Jesus. Your blood, your sin would, would be eradicated and erased and your blood would be purified with the blood of Jesus. Heaven would be your home. Uh, allow me to pray with you today. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I recognize you've seen everything. I, I, don't, I don't have to pretend like I've not done it. You've seen the most secret, horrendous things in my life that I've done, and I ask you to forgive me today. I will be a Christ follower all the days of my life. Jesus, come and live in my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I want to say welcome to the family today. You're no longer walking dead, but you are walking alive unto Christ, and your best days are ahead of you because you're not doing life alone. Jesus Christ is with you. Thanks for watching Real, and I hope to see you real soon. God bless. You gotta be willing to do what God tells you.